Welcome, everybody, to our uh, next webinar in our series. Today we'll be talking about medical cannabis in elder and end-of-life care here in Maine. And uh, I am your host, Becky Deboister. I'm the Director of Education here at Wellness Connection. Uh, I am joined by Kathy Cobb. I'll have her introduce herself in just a moment. Kathy is a member of our Board of Directors. And as always, we have producer Ben with us manning the soundboard, making us sound good. So thank you so much for spending some time with us today. I think this presentation will probably take a half an hour, maybe 45 minutes of your time. Uh, and it's an important topic. Uh, Maine has the oldest uh, average age population in the state. Um, we know that our medical cannabis members, um, our average age is 47. 0.5, I believe, and there's about 20% uh, of us who are 65 and up, uh, and you know we're we're all God willing aging, and and as our use uh, comes with us from our younger days, or perhaps we we get older and, and run into some conditions that that make us think, hmm, let's let's try that medical cannabis that uh, can raise some interesting questions. Um, in terms of, you know, the kinds of elder care that are uh, offered in the state, um, both for you and your families as well. Uh, I mentioned we're joined today by Kathy Cobb. She is a member of our board of directors. She works on outreach with me. Uh, Kathy also has a, a unique um, work history that gives her an interesting perspective on these issues. And I'm going to let Kathy talk a little bit about uh, about how, you know, what, what her insights are onto, onto the subject matter. Kathy, thank you. Thanks, Becky. Um, as Becky said, I'm on the Board of Directors of Wellness Connection, and I previously worked for 30 years with the main Department of Health and Human Services, and during that period of time had a long career in elder services, as well as licensing and regulatory services that brought me into contact with a number of long-term care providers. And so, um, when medical cannabis laws were expanded in the state in 2009, I was responsible for creating a regulatory framework for the medical marijuana program. So I've had both the um, advantage of working in elder care myself, as well as uh, working on the inside of the regulatory uh, structure for the medical uh, marijuana program. So it's a great interest that uh, Becky when uh, Becky asked me about uh, co-presenting today on uh, medical cannabis, cannabis for elder and end of life care, that you know, bringing together my my background and my work with wellness was uh, an over <laughs> And we're glad to have you. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to dive right in here. We'll go ahead to our first um, slide, possibly. And hold on just a second. There we go. Uh, we'll start with an overview of Maine's qualifying conditions. Um, and we know that you know, Maine has a fairly short list of qualifying conditions, um, but many of them are conditions that are common to the aging population. We know that uh, cancer is, is unfortunately common. Uh, the older we get, the more likely it is that we're going to develop a form of cancer. Uh, incidentally, Maine also, I believe, still has the highest incidence of cancer in our population of any of the 50 states. So not only are we the eldest state, we're, we're the uh, state most likely to, to have cancer problems. Um, <clears throat> ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease is not a disease that strikes only elderly people, but it certainly can. Uh, inflammatory bowel syndrome and Crohn's uh, can come along, you know, sort of digestive problems can come with aging. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, agitation of Alzheimer's, it's interesting that Alzheimer's itself is not a qualifying condition. Um, it is actually at the agitation of Alzheimer's. And Kathy, maybe you can talk a little bit about what that means for um, a, a patient or a family who's facing an Alzheimer's diagnosis and thinking that, that cannabis might be something they, they would be interested in trying. Well, Alzheimer's is a uh, terminal illness, and no one ever recovers from Alzheimer's. And as the disease progresses, um, most Alzheimer's patients do develop a certain amount of agitation as they 
as they more frequently uh, are unaware of a lot of uh, what they remember as being their daily routine and feeling a sense of agitation about not knowing who people are or where they are. And so many uh, family caregivers who have a, a, a family member at home who has Alzheimer's will experience increasing uh, caregiver problems as the patient themselves uh, gets more agitated, their heart has come de uh, calmed down, uh, they tend to uh, have an afternoon uh, condition that many people refer to as sundowning, where they continue to uh, ramp up, if you will, with their agitation levels, and sometimes aren't sleeping well at night, but more apt to be awake at night. And the agitation itself um, is one of the reasons why many family caregivers are no longer able to care for people at home. It just becomes too overwhelming for the person to make their own sense of balance in their life and take care of someone who's uh, uh, constantly agitated each day. Mm -hmm. And I would think that for a family member who's trying to keep mom or dad or grandpa in the home and care for them, I mean, that's very important to a lot of families. Um, by the time this agitation is developing, if they haven't already been thinking about medical marijuana, it's probably not the first thing that's going to pop into their minds, would you, would you say? That's right. I think most family members are at the coping stage. That mm -hmm. All they can do is try to cope and keep themselves uh, with a certain level of sanity while they're trying to deal with things that uh, are very unpredictable. Right, right. And, and so we'll, we'll come back and talk about what that might mean. You know, as Kathy points out, that uh, that agitation stage is often a trigger for folks moving into some sort of an assisted care facility. And one of the things that we want to talk about today is um, how do we how do we manage cannabis use in these facilities when the time comes? Um, so that's, that's a, a significant um, piece of the puzzle here. Intractable pain, certainly, um, you know, from rheumatoid arthritis to fibromyalgia to shoot the lingering of after effects of, of even shingles, um, you know, intractable pain is not uncommon for the elderly. Post-traumatic stress, certainly um, for some of our older veterans um, is, is not uncommon. And then symptoms like cachexia, which is um, basically uncontrolled vomiting, uh, and then muscle spasm. Um, so uh, the list is, is you know, of, of specific conditions is not very long. And we notice that there are some things that are not on it. Um, Parkinson's, for example is not a qualifying condition in Maine. Um, insomnia, which is you know, not uncommon as, as folks age, is, is not by itself a qualifying condition. For some of these conditions, depression and anxiety, et cetera, um, there may be an underlying condition that does fit in. So perhaps we have um, you know, cancer and, and obviously some anxiety and depression would come along with that. For Parkinson's, um, perhaps if there are muscle spasms happening or if um, the muscles are cramping and that's causing pain, um, there, are, there are, you know, ways to, to address these things with um, medical marijuana, even though it is not expressly listed in the qualifying conditions. So access points under the main medical use of marijuana program. Um, there are basically three options, using a dispensary, having a caregiver grow for you, or using a home grower. Uh, now we can certainly, um, you know, for somebody who is aging at home, perhaps growing their own medicine is, is an option for them. Uh, but if the move has been made to even a, a senior community, uh, home growing may not be an option. I don't know of any facilities right now that are allowing patients in Maine to grow cannabis in their in their senior living facility apartments. Do you know of any yet? Um, I don't know of any that actually allow it. Um, there have been some situations uh, going back to my day with the Department of Health and Services where we would find a patient or two with a um, cannabis plant on their windows in their room. Mm -hmm. I suppose it was discovered it was no longer allowed, but uh, <laughs> um, these aren't settings in which most people are going to be able to um, access their own uh, garden area or growing um, uh, area in the facility. Yeah, yeah. I visited a couple um, facilities that, that, you know, 
have a variety of services and maybe you move in there and it is just a senior retirement community and everybody has their own apartment and they have their own gardening space outside in some of them. But as yet, I have not encountered any of those folks who are willing to, you know, say, yes, we're going to let you plant your six plants out in the <laughs> in, your, in your private garden. Um, but we'll keep working on that. So uh, for, for what this means for most elder patients who are not living at home, is that their sourcing has to come from a dispensary uh, or an, an individual caregiver. And if the patient is not uh, mobile or able to get out, they need to find either a dispensary that will deliver or a caregiver who can uh, come to them. Um, there, there, are, there are two forms of caregivers. There are caregivers who uh, can grow and sell marijuana to the patient. And there are also uh, people who can um, sign up as a caregiver who's a non-growing caregiver that can help a patient who's not able to get out to purchase their medicine uh, and, and do that for them. So there are ways to uh, find a professional caregiver or a family or friend who's willing to do that, even though they're not actually growing the medicine themselves. Right. Okay. All right. A couple more points about the medical cannabis program. Patients have to obtain a certification from an MD, a DO, or actually, this this there, this is actually an error. This should not say uh, RN. This this right here should be a nurse practitioner. So let's draw a line through that, and it should be a nurse practitioner. This is my first time using pen on the show. So. <laughs> All right. Um, what are the challenges, Kathy, for somebody who is say you know? not able to leave their facility or, or very frail and you know even a trip to the regular primary care physician is a, might be a challenge. I think that's one of the big barriers to people who are in the facility to get out to their physician. Um, all of the things that are required to have an education for the other care physician. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that their physician that the patient or the family or any of the family are interested in trying cannabis that the so that the primary physician or their practitioner may be willing to do that. And so uh, trying to find a practitioner who is more willing to do that for them uh, would involve some additional transportation. So it might be difficult for someone without a family uh, to be able to, to get out and do what they need to do to obtain a certification. Right, right. But if they're, if they're, actually I have a question for you. Do, if I move into, um, let's say, an assisted living facility, can are, are there doctors on site that I could designate as my primary, or does my primary, you know, assisted living facilities and residential care facilities don't have medical directors? So, okay, um, they usually rely on the person as an individual physician. Would you get it to a skilled nursing facility or a hospice a patient hospice program? Mm -hmm. Those facilities each have a pharmacy mm -hmm. consultant as well as uh, medical directors. So those are more keyed into the plan on site. Okay, and, and I'm getting ahead of myself. We will go through those, those different types of facility in a little more detail in just a moment. Um, I'm just curious, uh, you know, to, to know whether you know of any of those skilled care facilities where the on-site medical staff is willing to um, to certify. I'm not aware of anything at this point. Okay, so that is frustrating. Maybe this is an area where telemedicine can come into play. Um, you know, it would have to be coordinated, I would think, with, you know, the, the certifying cannabis specialist doctor and the primary care physician and likely the family, ideally, you know. I when, do. when it comes to facilities, I think it's important if the um, person's primary physician is not the certifying physician mm -hmm. uh, and the facility doesn't have, and the facility has a medical director, that whoever's doing the certification needs to have good communication because, the, the nursing home or the school nursing facility or the hospice has to control a person. Right. And so it's important to know that someone's using medical cannabis in order to prevent the duplication of uh, medication to save the pain. Right. Right. And I'm wondering too um, about who administers the, the cannabis. Um, to date, the experience has only varied across the spectrum. Um, most facilities. Uh, and I'll use school nursing as an example. Most facilities today still have a fear that the federal government will 
uh, come in and snatch up their federal financing. And so they've been reluctant to have a hands on role in the administration of uh, cannabis in the facilities. So quite often it will be either a resident self administering their medication or having a family member mm -hmm. uh, come in and doing that regularly. Obviously, if this is a medication that somebody needs regularly, it could rely on somebody from the outside to come in. Uh, is more problematic. When you get to the residential care and assisted living, people are generally uh, more uh, ambulatory and have more cognitive awareness, even though we have a large Alzheimer's folk population in assisted living and residential care. Mm -hmm. And the chances that they might be able to uh, have the medication on their person and take it themselves is greater. Right, right. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the, the program itself. Um, we, we passed a medical marijuana law back in 1999 here in Maine. Um, and I believe that just allowed for caregiver, individual caregivers. And then in 2009, we modified and passed another citizen's initiative that created these dispensaries um, and made some changes to the caregiver program. And um, this is, I know this is an area of expertise for you, Kathy. Um, what is the difference between statute and rules? Because well, statute is the governing law. So whatever is in statute um, can't be changed or waived. Mm -hmm. And to clarify or give some additional structure to what is in the law, the legislature can grant rulemaking authority to the state agency. So with regard to the marijuana program, um, statute gave uh, the Department of Health and Human Services uh, rulemaking authority to add and clarify the rules, but we can't change the law. Okay. Um, I actually once had a, a legislature a legislator ask me if I could write a rule to uh, correct what he thought was an unjust law, and I said, <laughs> "No, I think that's your job." <laughs> so what we just try okay. to do is give you know the public out there uh, enough information to set up a program and run it that will be compliant with the law. Okay, all right. And you did work for the Division of Licensing and Regulatory Services. Yes, I did. Okay. Um, and so not only do they have oversight of the medical marijuana program, but also of these types of uh, facilities, facilities that we're talking about. Okay. And I just want to clarify that anything I say today is mm -hmm. as a member of Wellness Connection is, is not uh, reflecting an opinion of the Department of Health and Human Services. Absolutely not. No. But 30 years of experience. <laughs> All right. Um, insomnia is not one of our qualifying conditions, but if you have it, uh, we have a non medical treatment for it. You can go look up the statute and the rules there at the website. Um, and if you can get past you know, four or five pages without dozing, you have to be a regulatory geek to appreciate it. <laughs> you really do. <laughs> so. All right. Let's see. Let's talk about some of these types of facilities. So I, I broke them out into different uh, categories here. Um, and I kind of started with, I think, the least assisted, like the most, uh, the, the resident has the most autonomy in a senior living situation. Am I correct there? Uh, yes, there are a couple types of senior living. Uh, senior living can be as simple as um, subsidized housing where there's a 55 and over uh, age limit for people to move in. There are also other types of senior living uh, that are sometimes referred to as independent living services mm -hmm. where you have an apartment but you can also get housekeeping, uh, laundry services, meals uh, that are not real person oriented but more service oriented. And those are, as I said, called the independent uh, living services. Okay. Um, assisted living, there's a, it's a step up. And there are two forms, one is assisted living, one is uh, residential care. And the difference between that and the other senior living settings is that in assisted living facility, in the residential care facility, they actually actually administer the medication where they're not allowed, hmm. where they're not allowed to be in unless you have a less, less structured setting. Less structured so setting. So in the years of the you have to have the staff ability to administer their prescription medications and over, over the counter medications. Um, from a physical environment, um, assisted living um, is an apartment setting, so it's much more private. So if you are living in an assisted living facility and you have your medications, they, they would be considered safe in your apartment because you've got the ability to lock the door when you freeze. 
And in residential care, the doors aren't locked, and you may, even though you may have a private room. Um, so if you were going to store your medicine in a residential care facility in your room, you still want to make sure that it was secure, mm. other than thinking that you're going to lock the door. Oh, interesting. Okay, okay. And yet, yeah, assisted living and residential care do not have medical staff on site? They do not. They no, do they not. But they can don't. still administer your prescription medication for you. Yes. Okay, gotcha. Great. And then there are three other types of so skilled nursing, inpatient hospice, and home hospice. What, what can you tell us about these? Well, skilled nursing uh, facilities are uh, considered nursing homes in the state, and uh, all nursing homes are required to provide long term care and skilled nursing care. Okay. Uh, where in skilled nursing, you have to have a real nursing room uh, that needs to be uh, managed by a nurse, and it's a shorter term stay than long term. Nursing home care. Okay. Um, skilled nursing is generally covered by Medicare, mm -hmm. and say uh, covered by Medicare is, is generally very limited. Uh, inpatient hospice is also a residency program, um, much like skilled. You know, it's, a, it's an inpatient facility uh, that's staffed and generally will have a room or a shared room in an inpatient hospice. Home hospice is just like. Um, Inpatient hospice, except that the services are provided in the place where the person lives. Mm -hmm. And the place where the person lives could be in a nursing home I or see. the system of facility where the hospice staff actually go in and provide uh, the hospice care. Gotcha. So if I am a patient in an inpatient hospice setting and I wish to use my cannabis tincture, um, what, what are some of the hurdles that I might <laughs> experience? First of all, if, you know, as a family, when you make a decision about inpatient hospice or hospice in general, if you think that cannabis is going to be part of what you want uh, to do, you should discuss it with the facility and make sure that they don't have a policy that says you won't allow cannabis mm -hmm. um, uh, as part of the inpatient stay. So it's important to have that discussion with the master the facility uh, can agree or not agree. But that might be part of the, what they will accommodate or provide for you. And if and that's, that's not right. acceptable to you, try to find another hospice provider who's willing to do that. Right, right. Um, you know, this, this is part of the patient's choice to make a decision to go to a facility that's more active to accommodate their needs. Right, right. Um, do you, I mean, in your experience, have you encountered facilities that have a written policy that says no? To cannabis, um, I, I, I think there are a few. I think okay. there are a few who, who say that as their written policy. Okay. Um, and I think it's a uh, uh, convenience to the facility to have a policy like that. You know, they don't have to confront hard decisions all the time. Help a family or help an individual. Uh, we'll still do it. Um, right, right, right. And we'll talk a little bit more. I'm glad you touched on that because I, you know, the, the I, I deal with these facilities, certainly the hospice facilities. Um, that should be one of their goals, right? Should be one of their goals. And I believe that a lot of the education facilities now are trying to figure out how to do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I get the sense there's a lot of don't ask, don't tell going and on. That seems to be the primary way in which many facilities are addressing this. If they don't have a written policy specifically prohibiting it, uh, they may try to find a way to allow a family member to come in or allow patients to use it. They don't want to get involved right. in the actual responsibility of the patient. Yes. Right. Or storing it. Right. Right. And how frustrating for patients who are not, who don't have family or who are unfriended, who, you know, who are alone at this time of their life. So um, the more facilities, it seems to me, the more of these facilities that start um, opening themselves up to this, the, the better, especially the, given the the population trends in Maine. I mean, more and more folks are choosing this outside of a care facility, and they're going to want to start bringing it with them. They right? are, and I think that the pressure is going to come from families. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why people should think about whether cannabis uh, should be part of their end of decisions before they go to a facility. Because uh, otherwise, uh, if they're going in and trying to start fresh mm -hmm. with a facility that's not used to this, and being a relatively new cannabis user right. could present problems for both the patient care and the facility. Right. We don't want people to have that experience. We don't want none of those people. Right. <laughs> Aging, family, staff. All right. Well, thank you for that for that overview. That helps. That helps a great deal.
Um, I do want us to talk a little bit about LD 1779 because we did one of one of the functions of these rule making processes that, that you know sort of modify how we implement statutes. Um, you know, LD 1779 is one of those. Uh, no, it's actually a statute. Is that a statute? That became, so that became okay. part of the main law, and so there okay. is an actual uh, statutory uh, number. Okay, gotcha. Uh, All right. Um, and as part of, of what this legislation did, uh, it changed and clarified um, use of storage of cannabis in at least these two types of facilities, right? That's right. Okay, so when they say nursing facility, do they mean skilled nursing or do they mean assisted living? Or? They, they only mean a facility that's licensed in the state of the nursing facility. Okay, okay, gotcha. Um, so in these two types of settings, we have changed the law to say that patients may use forms of prepared marijuana that are not smoked. So prior to uh, 2014, that was just across the board blankets not acceptable in these um, No, the, the, the Division of Licensing Regulatory Services does have rules for nursing facilities and the hospitals governing how they need to get the cannabis into the facilities for administering. Mm -hmm. um, what this uh, change in law allowed was for the patients and the residents themselves to be able to use it and keep it um, with them. I think there's another paragraph um, mm -hmm. that we'll come to in a minute that talks about storing it in the rooms. But it, 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 it is getting to a point where uh, now this is much more location oriented in terms of you, know, you may use it. Mm -hmm. So those are not smoked. Okay. Generally, smoking is prohibited uh, in general in, in all our healthcare facilities. Right, right. All right. But but they do allow vaporizer, which is fascinating. Um, and didn't we just change our our general smoking laws? Didn't we just scoop all e-cigarettes and all the vaporized products into? Right. Um, this this law um, that allows people to use vaporized marijuana in certain facilities in the process. I was passed in 2014, and then in 2015, the legislature passed a law, I think it had unintended consequences, that um, actually scoops up vaporizing marijuana mm -hmm. in the definition of a cigarette. Right. So uh, I think those of us who uh, would like to see patients put in schools be able to vaporize need to go back to the legislature and advocate, advocate that they. Uh, look at that uh, right. uh, as far as where people can use the horizon. Agreed or not uh, for, for that use. That makes a lot of sense. And we know the vaporizing. I mean, edibles uh, are, are, you know, very powerful and great for pain and they're long-lasting, you know, good good night sleep. Uh, but when somebody is experiencing, a, you know, acute pain, vaporizing is, is the way to go. So. All right, what else did 1779 do? It looks like it allows folks to store their prepared marijuana in their room. That's correct. Even though some of those rooms and those facilities, you can't shut the door and lock it like we were talking about. Right. Um, I think that any responsible uh, use of uh, medication in the Catholic Sundays is going to need to be kept under lock and key. Mm -hmm. um, most residents of inpatient facilities um, often have a degree of mental incapacity where they could see, say, an edible mm -hmm. in someone's uh, nightstand and, and want to share in that. So right. uh, people need to be able to, if they're going to have it in the facility, they can keep it at their bedside to actually store in the same unit so that no one else can have, uh, have access to it and they can come into the hospital. So, right, right. And we do offer, you know, what, what we're seeing here on the screen, these little uh, lock boxes that come with Kind of a light chain style cord that you could wrap around the, uh, you know, a shelf or a support in a closet, or you know, you, you could definitely secure that and, and lock that up to, to keep it safe. And the other piece that that this did is that it, it removed a requirement that a staff member at the facility has to be designated as a primary caregiver. It does, and it also removes the requirement that the patient themselves register as patient. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, they don't have to go to the department to get a registered identification card, don't have to designate the provider um, as their caregiver. So, much more simplistic approach. Yeah, yeah. You would think that this would have resulted in a lot more open 
cannabis policy in some of these facilities. But <laughs> it does, but in the scheme of things, I don't think the facilities are thinking that uh, proactively. Right. We can help them. <laughs> All right. And finally, LB 1779 still gives them the power to prohibit or restrict the use or storage, right? So right. I'm sure that was necessary to, to gain the support of some of these facilities, right? Yeah. They still needed the, the, the feeling that the they cover, could, right, that they could set their own programs. All right. And again, these are just inpatient hospice and nursing facilities. So these, this does not address assisted living or those residential care or home hospice facilities. So those folks can do whatever they want. Well, not quite. And they're, they're governed by the rest of the law mm -hmm. that pertains to the medical marijuana program. So you get into having a physician certification, you get into having access, um, you know, being limited to where you can access your medication, you can have a caregiver, being able to get it yourself. Right. All of those things that occur currently in the law, uh, there aren't any special provisions that would apply to them. Gotcha. Thank you. All right, we talked a little bit about uh, methods of ingestion. Um, I, you know, I, I left inhalation in here because it is still an option, although we do need to work out the e-cigarettes, medical cannabis vaporizing um, issue. Uh, edibles and, and topicals, though, it seems to me are, are sort of what, what maybe the patients themselves uh, who are in these facilities would, would be more comfortable with. Anyway, anyway, I don't know if you have thoughts on that, but it seems to me that, you know, being able to add a little bit of tincture to my tea, especially if I'm an older person who hasn't used cannabis in a long time or is, you know, more cautious or um, concerned about it, um, that might be a, a, an easier entry point than handing somebody a vapor pen and saying, have at it. Right, and, and I think you have to remember that uh, a lot of people we're talking about who are facilities are going to be cannabis and and so whatever uh, choice of ingestion method or, or uh, method of administration, you know, we need to make sure that we start more, mm -hmm. we start small, yep. and make sure that people don't have an uncomfortable um, reaction to their first uh, experience with this. So right. yes, there are advantages and disadvantages to each of the different types of uh, uh, administration, and it has to has to be tailored to what's going to benefit the person the most. Like you mentioned, the inhalation gives you the, uh, the quickest onset of the relief that you're looking for, yet for long-term relief uh, in a smooth night or a smooth day, mm -hmm. and the others might be a better option for right. different times of day. So it's possible that many people might be using more than one form of administration. Right. right. I would almost think that maybe people who need more, more care, more, more skilled nursing, say, um, or who are less uh, aware of their surroundings, it, it would almost, it puts more of an onus on either a, a care provider or a family member to be administering, right? And so, you know, I, I, I remember when my, my grandma was in, the, in a skilled nursing facility, you know, my mom would go as often as she could, sometimes several times a day, but gosh, to be there every hour to, to help her, you know, inhale from the vapor, I think, I think, not. I think that will make a great deal of sense for to people. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would agree with you. Um, but don't, don't play those topicals, too, for the, that neuropathic or arthritic pain. It could be really, really helpful. Um, I, I felt that we should list potential side effects uh, because, you know, we are using this as a, as a, a drug, as a, a therapy, um, and, you know, they, they do exist. Uh, they do not exist for the topicals. Um, you can get great pain relief from a topical and you will not uh, have a, a euphoric effect um, unless you're using a transdermal patch. They need to add something, you know, like a basic coconut oil topical is not going to penetrate to your bloodstream uh, the way that some of the chemicals in those patches can, can help. Oh, right. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah or a nicotine patch, right. Um, but euphoria is a possibility. Uh, increased blood pressure, although that happens uh, in, the, in the first 15 to 30 minutes after early, yeah, early onset, and then that actually your blood pressure decreases, which can also be an issue for elder folks. Uh, dizziness certainly can be of concern for these folks. They're frail, some of them. Uh, change in space-time perception, hunger, I don't know if that's a negative or a positive side effect for <laughs> It might be the reason why you were taking it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
sleepiness again, you know, for these folks who have trouble, you know, resting at night and and anxiety and paranoia. So talk to me about how that how you see that playing into that agitation of Alzheimer's or those that frustration that a dementia patient feels. Um, it, it's it's very possible that, that could exacerbate um, an agitation. Uh, so you have to look carefully at the screen that you're using to try to minimize some of the effects. That, you know, if you're trying to fix a symptom, mm -hmm. you want to fix a, a screen that's not going to exacerbate the symptom. Right. right. Gotcha. Um, all right. And I, I just, I, I'm sure that we could come up with some other side effects. Um, but these are the, you know, these, these are the most common things that people experience. They really are. Um, and compared to the side effects lists on some of the pharmaceuticals that we would love to do a side by side. It would take more than one screen, I think, <laughs> for some of them. So, and I like the fact that, you know, um, a little bit of euphoria. If someone really has to be a depression, oh my gosh. This is a bad thing. Yeah, in this population, holy cow. So let's talk about some of the benefits. Um, Clearly, uh, well, actually, let's, let's actually start with some of the numbers here. Uh, I did some research. Um, there's a, a, a clinical uh, pharmacists group that, that pulled together a whole bunch of research. 92% of folks 65 and up have at least one chronic condition, and 77 have two or more. I found that very, although the older I get, I guess I can see it. Can see it. Um, Elders age 65 to 69 take an average of 14 prescription drugs. And you'll find that number increases when you go to long-term care. Why is that level? Um, they're older, mm -hmm. they've got more conditions, mm -hmm. uh, worse conditions, and it's not uncommon to see something on uh, 16, 18, 20 different mm -hmm. medications. I don't think I, I, I sniffed it, but they did have a, a, a follow-up to the 65 to 69. I want to say it was the 80 to 85. It was up to 18 prescriptions. How much of that, and maybe this, I mean, yeah, you, you regulated, I know you weren't always right there at the bedside in these facilities, but how much of that is prescribing something to take care of side effects from another prescription? Uh, a lot of it is. Really? It, a lot of it is. Um, unfortunately, most prescription medications come with side effects that you, you don't want to eliminate the, the first drug that was administered, so you start adding on additional drugs mm -hmm. uh, to counteract some of the common uh, uh, side effects yeah. of the prescription drugs, and so you end up with what they refer to as polypharmacy. Okay. And I, I think opioids and constipation is one common one. In fact, I believe I saw a, a television commercial for a, an anti-constipation drug, and it, it was I mean, targeted at folks who are on opioids. Right. So OIC, opioid induced constipation. Yeah. And their little cartoon guy, you know, digested. So it was. <laughs> if anyone has an experience with having had surgery and being prescribed painkillers after surgery, most people can mm -hmm. uh, uh, appreciate the, uh, the, the mm -hmm. short term use of opioids and take someone who has chronic pain, for example, mm -hmm. and is going to be using painkillers for a long term. Those side effects end up being really a, 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 an adverse effect on their quality of life. Right, right. You found an interesting uh, article um, poking around online uh, about, you called it polypharmacy. Um, and I just wondered if, if you wanted to, to chat well, about that a little bit. This was just an interesting uh, story. It's from the Journal of the American Medical Association. Um, and the article had to do with uh, actually a hospice diagnosis of someone who had polypharmacy. And we referred to the story of a teachable moment. An 86 year old woman with a moderate dementia, depression, and osteoporosis fell and suffered a compression fracture. And she was an assisted living patient. And so, as part of the uh, uh, the rehabilitation, she had aspirin dosages of opioids, um, and she walked with us, um, and she suffered from severe constipation. So, uh, the effect of all that was to, um, in kind of a rapid fashion, she started becoming withdrawn and repeatedly called out for help for unclear reasons, and so she was started on other medications such as diazepam and mm. haloperidol. 
when her vocalization is increased and her cognition works to the, to the point where she stopped walking, the belt pressure ulcer, uh, she lost weight, and she was enrolled in the hospice uh, care program, which means uh, they now at this point given her a terminal diagnosis. So when she became met bound, um, they called in a, a geriatrician who evaluated her. And he suspected that her problem wasn't that she was going to die, or although she may have because of the, the state that she was in, but that she had been on uh, too many medications. Mm -hmm. So he discontinued the pain medication, stopped the diazepam, uh, tapering her off as you go to for that, um, educated the care providers about some of the daily routine, and started some physical uh, and occupational therapy and uh, got her back on her feet. They gave her uh, some medication for anxiety, some melatonin for sleep, and some acetaminophen for pain. So mm -hmm. they swapped out all the opioids for some acetaminophen, and she returned to her people functional status. And wow. too often we you know, see the side effects of the medications and say, you know, there's nothing more we can do, and maybe we should be doing less. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. And how amazing is they could have tried some tincture of cannabis for that pain instead of the yeah, acetaminophen. Yeah, that would have avoided the whole situation. Right. Because doesn't acetaminophen, that, that puts a load on your liver. It's not, and cannabis does not do this. So, well, so many good reasons. So many good reasons for us to be trying to incorporate this into our elder care. Obviously, we want to reduce opioid use. Uh, not because, you know, grandma is out selling her pills or at that age, maybe we're not worried about addiction even, but you know, it's it's not hard, it's hard on our bodies. Um, and it does, it puts more of them out into circulation, right? Um, so let's let's cut those down. The psychotropics, um, benzos, benzodiazepines, and that that was the like when she started the, the patient you were just telling us about when she started calling out and, and being agitated, that's where they, they went. Those that's correct. Wow. I'll try to calm it down. Okay. Um, the American Healthcare Association has uh, some goals for psychotropic use in these facilities this year. Well, one of the nice things about long-term care in this country is that there's a great deal of uh, data and information that's gathered about all the patients. Mm -hmm. uh, throughout the country, they use what they refer to as uniform assessment tools so that you can compare this to home to nurse home and mm -hmm. state to state in terms of how they do provide quality of care. And American Healthcare Association is the national organization that uh, many nursing homes belong to. And one of their quality initiatives is to reduce the use of psychotropics. Wow. And there's also a great uh, deal of concern at the federal level that uh, physicians are prescribing too many old people mm -hmm. uh, to patients. And so you know, we feel that those are uh, places where uh, people thinking about medical cannabis can converge with people who are trying to reduce mm -hmm. uh, both the use of opioids and psychotropics and the adverse effects of those drugs. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, improved alertness and just general quality of life. And I would say quality of life not only for the patient, but also for the family, for the staff. I mean, you know. The yeah, it's much more pleasant to go visit you know, a loved one in a nursing facility when they're not agitated and right. upset. Right, <laughs> exactly. So, so uh, just one more little stat there. Seniors are 13% of the population and they consume 40% of prescription drugs. So um, we, have, we have some, you know, we have work to do in this area and cannabis can, can really help. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about advanced directives. It's hard for, I think, us in this country to think about um, you know, we, we don't always want to plan for our end of life <laughs> care. It's, it's easier not to think about it. Um, but what can you tell us about, uh, you know, does cannabis fit into an advanced directive? Should I put it in my, in my living will? Where does it fit? What is an advanced directive? An advanced directive is a way that while you still have your cognitive ability, mm -hmm. um, you can indicate what your end of life desire is. And most normally, uh, the advanced directives will talk about you know, if my doctor says that I'm not going to recover from this, I don't want any extraordinary measures, I don't want mm -hmm. to be resuscitated if I, um, you know, if my heart stops beating. Right. Um, and most of us uh, at our age, I won't say what my age is, but most mm -hmm. of us do have it being practice. So, mm -hmm. You know, our uh, attorneys will ask us about that, our own doctors will ask us if we've got advanced directives. And mm -hmm. what you can do with those advanced directives is that you make sure that your doctor has a copy of it. Okay. Yes. And so, in addition to food, uh, 
uh, hydration, uh, resuscitation. There is a place on the advanced directive, and Becky has uh, indicated here where you can actually download uh, an advanced directive form to fill out. There is a place where it's kind of left open where you can indicate something that's not typically mm. uh, indicated in the inspections of the advanced directives. And if you look at that, and, if, and you think that um, cannabis use at, at end of life or um, well, these are really geared towards the end of life decisions, mm -hmm. that you would rather have cannabis for pain relief rather than the objective or the above. Mm -hmm. uh, these are things that you could, I believe, designate on that. Wow, wow. And then how, how, are, how do facilities and these advanced directives interact? Are they, are they held to... If I go to a hospital. The advanced yeah. directive is an agreement really between the uh, person and the healthcare provider, okay. their, their physician. Okay. And so the physician, all the care is provided in the advanced model of the Right. So if you give an advanced directive, those are your express wishes mm -hmm. uh, in regard to those decisions. Okay. I'm, I'm just I'm wondering, I, I almost feel like we should have a what would they do if they were that, that would be a great, yeah. great discussion yeah if they encountered a patient whose advanced directive included this which mine well, good mine too <laughs> <laughs> definitely <laughs> well yeah I did, I did put the link there i guess every state has a slightly different form um but you can download that and i didn't realize i guess in my head i had thought that an advanced directive was the same thing as a living will, but I see that the living will is a piece of that, and right. there are other considerations. So, um, wow, all right, we have a lot. To think so, I think that's all. Kathy, are there any topics that we haven't touched on, or any, what, would, what would your if, if if you could give a piece of advice to a family member or or perhaps an, an elderly person who is listening, uh, who is thinking about going into some form of of care facility from senior living all the way up. Um, what, what would you advise? I would, I would advise families and older people to think about the relationship between quality of life and prescription drugs mm. and to really find a way to educate themselves about um, healthier options mm -hmm. than opioids. I think that what we know about cannabis today is that it's relatively safe. Mm -hmm. Uh, the side effects are minimal, mm -hmm. uh, and they're not, and, and it's impossible to overdose. <laughs> this is true, right? Um, and so I like to see people really um, um, have information available to them so that they can make those choices. Mm -hmm. um, the, the world is governed by uh, the FDA, yeah. the Food Drug Administration, in terms of what the Food and Drug Administration uh, will approve for drugs that you can have purchased legally, um, and there is growing pressure on the FDA to uh, approve some additional medications that are um, marijuana-based, like a fat mm -hmm. uh, spray, which is an oral spray of components of marijuana. It's not synthetic, it's not artificial, it's the real deal. Right. Yet, since marijuana is still illegal in this country, mm -hmm. when the FDA decided to look at fat as a drug, that could be given legally, they decided to fast track it, which usually means that you'll get a decision in just a few months. Right. That was four years ago. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. um, the feds are uh, faced with uh, not being able to move forward on things they'd like to move forward on simply because uh, of the fact that it's still a So you've got, you've got to find other ways to uh, get education about what you know. Um, use marijuana for. Mm -hmm. And I think that also leads to another point, which is, you know, the physicians, although, although you know, I know they are, their hearts are in the right place and they want to do the right thing, they haven't really learned about this as anything but a drug of abuse. And so I think that family members need to be willing not only to educate themselves, but also to act as advocates and educators for the physicians, for the the facility staff and, and the nurses that they encounter as well. I think that places to look in terms of future public policy are the training that healthcare providers receive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. We as a company have done some work with um, the University of England, which yeah. medical students, yeah. uh, to try to raise awareness 
of sort of science that isn't incorporated into what students learn um, so that they have more of an open mind when they get out of medical school yeah. about looking at some alternative uh, uses of uh, other types of medicine, right? Well, and I think you touched on it earlier. Um, part of this, not to be crass or cynical, but the market will push this as well when these facilities. Just like the citizens' initiative. Once that's right. They, once the uh, public uh, says what they want, yeah, it will become a marketing thing for facilities where, right, if enough people say this is what I want to do, they will see this as something that they have kind of a moral obligation to do right. for their economies. Yes, I would agree. All right, well, Kathy, it's been great to spend some time with you this afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and if you folks who are listening have any questions about uh, elder care, campus, uh, any of the topics that we've been discussing today, you can feel free to contact us at info at mainwellness.org, I-N-F-O at mainwellness.org. Uh, visit us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and our website has a ton of great information. Uh, thank you again for listening. And Becky the Voice of Wellness Connection in Maine. Producer Ben and I are saying goodbye for another session of our webinar series. Take care.